Good morning, fair humans. I hope you are all doing well. It is Monday, April 13th as I'm recording this, but I'm recording this for our Tuesday, April 14th, 2020 class. We are in the midst of Corona Plague. Uh, all is well here at the Berzer House, and I hope you guys are all doing extremely well where you are, and I hope you had a really, really wonderful Easter. So uh, I'm glad uh, I had a great, great time with my kids and uh, we got to celebrate Easter Vigil Mass online, uh, which was pretty wild, uh, but it worked. And so we had the whole family around the computer and we were watching Easter Vigil stream from St. Anthony's with Father David and uh, it was good, really good. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm eager to get back to reality, not just augmented reality, but reality. Not just virtual reality, I should say, but reality, like you know, physical things. I'm hitting my book, by the way. Um, yes, those kinds of things. But regardless, I hope you guys are doing well. And I am glad to have our class again, even if I am staring into the Macintosh. But I can pretend that you guys are all right in front of me. I do have a good imagination, so that does help. Okay, Brad, stop bloviating. See, I'm, I'm tempted again to show off and like, okay let you see some of my my action figures again. I actually got several comments last week about showing you my Rush figures, mostly about why Rush couldn't be the world's greatest rock band, uh, which of course, that's not true. They are the world's greatest rock band, or were at least, until Neil Peart passed away. So uh, yeah, that don't worry, that's not going to show up on your final or anything, but I do think it's one of those things that all educated people should know. So... <laughs> All right, I'm sorry. I am really, really being silly. Part of it is uh, I've been up now for about an hour as I'm recording this, but I think I just finally woke up about three minutes ago. So, okay, if you remember last week, we were talking about Russell Kirk, and I want to keep talking about Russell Kirk. I want to talk about his personality. I want to talk about how humane he was, and I want to talk about some of his ideas as they get expressed, not just in terms of what he thought was good culturally, but what he thought was good artistically as well. We'll see how far we get today. I'm not quite sure. Uh, I'm guessing that I'll be talking about Kirk at least both lectures this week. But I'm not positive about that. So we're just going to see how things go. And it may even go more. I mean, it's possible. We'll talk about Kirk next week as well. But there are other figures. I, I want to go back and look at Dawson a little bit. I'd like to look at Eric Vogelin uh, and Robert Nisbet. So there are a couple of figures I still want to talk about before we get to the end of the semester. And if I remember right, I think we have five classes left. Um, I have to double check that. But I think that's right. Five, including this one. So anyway, I may be wrong about that, but uh, I'll, I'll double check. But if you remember when we were talking about Russell Kirk, so born in 1918, passes away in 1994, the great figure in terms of founding post-war conservatism, he made a statement in one of his later books called The Roots of American Order, a book that came out in 1974 uh, and served in many ways as the basis for your Western heritage course. But in that book, The Roots of American Order, which is really a history of Western civilization more than anything else, he made this statement about the, the nature of humanity in which he said, in every age, society has been relieved only by the endeavors of a few people moved by the grace of God. And that, that's a very, very Kirkian statement. And he believed quite strongly that as human beings, we each had a fundamental duty to use the gifts that God had given us for the betterment of ourselves and our neighbors and our society. But he also believed strongly then by that, that same account that we probably, very few of us, would change the world in really dramatic ways and that we should be generally satisfied with changing ourselves and changing our neighbors. That that's where the real change in history comes from. Not necessarily from the Alexander the Greats or from the Napoleons, but really from average but talented women and men doing what was right in a moment. And so one of the things that Kirk tried to get at 
was that, and this shouldn't surprise us, especially given everything we've talked about with T.S. Eliot and some of the others in Christian humanism, every single moment we're making moral decisions. And those moral decisions cumulatively make up the history of the world. So if we have 7 billion people, and of course not all 7 billion are awake at the same moment, but imagine they were every single decision they make is the sum of history. So it's not enough to simply look at the great women and men of history. We have to understand that real historical change comes from those moment by moment decisions that add up then and make the great decisions of the world. Because when we make the wrong decision, it leads us down the wrong path. And when we realize that, we have to backtrack to the moment where we made that wrong decision and start over again from that decision and then make the right decision. And that's Kirk. It also fits C.S. Lewis so well, uh, but it's a very Christian humanist view of the world, a, an attempt to understand free will, but recognizing that every choice we makes, uh, make opens up a million other choices. So it's not like the angels who make one choice and then follow that choice for the rest of their existence. Human choice is different because we can make a million choices and most of them can be good and, and many of them can be bad. And we can go back and we can change that which was good. We can make bad and that which was bad. We can make good. Kirk, of course, wants us to make everything as good as possible as any good person would but he also recognizes that there are a myriad of choices. So let me read that one more time. In every age, society has been relieved only by the endeavors of a few people moved by the grace of God. So we focus on those who make the largest changes, but in fact, it's those of us who make the million small good changes that really do influence history. And we rarely know how. So, you know, I, I hope that as a teacher, what I say makes a difference. But when does it make a difference? Uh, at the moment, probably most of you are thinking, well, we've got to get through this semester. You know, is this something Dr. Berzer wants us to know for the exam? That's all good. Right? That's the kind of utilitarian aspect of the class. But Kirk means something to the effect of, 10 years from now, will you pick up one of these books, uh, maybe when you're in the middle of a, a crisis at work, and think about, well, what would the Christian humanist do? Or will you think about, oh, what was said in that class? Or what did my neighbor do for me in that class? Or what happened at Hillsdale College that year? Now, obviously, this year will always be shaped by the fact that this is the coronavirus year, which is you know, one of those things that I think is, is obviously terribly, terribly sad uh, because it means we can't be together. But it also gives a uniqueness to this year. Uh, you'll never forget this year. You'll remember it more, and you'll remember the time you're not together as much as the time you are together. Say, when you're my age and you're looking back 30 years later uh, on college, these things will stand out and they will have serious meaning. And Kirk says, well, what do you do about it at that time? So in Kirk's understanding of the way that we make history good, we always do the right thing wherever possible. We help our neighbor wherever possible. We share our wealth, as Kirk did all the time, and I'll, I'll get to that either in today's lecture or in uh, a later lecture. But we, be chari we, we should be charitable at all times. We act for the benefit of our neighbor, and we do what is best, not just for us, but for the common good. And that could mean anything from a kind word to a kind gesture, to a sharing of five dollars, to whatever it may be. Uh, those are the kinds of things that Kirk is thinking of, that he thinks could shape something. So uh, in the long run, so imagine uh, perhaps uh, you gave uh, an hour of your time to your neighbor and you didn't really have that time to give, but you did anyway because your neighbor needed it. There may not be direct results from that. In fact, the neighbor may even take for granted that you did that. But in some way, maybe 30 years from now, the fact that you were that witness, that you did the right thing at that moment, might shape one of your other friends who wasn't involved in it but knew the story and in a moment of crisis or in a moment of normalcy suddenly remembered, oh yeah, I remember when this person did that and uh, it was a good thing. I need to do that right now too. So 
these, the results of these things could be 30 years hence or more, 100 years hence, maybe a word passed on from family to family. So we can't look for the dramatic results immediately. We have to recognize that quite often real change is slow, it is incremental, it happens over time. So let's talk about Kirk and his genius for a moment, because I don't want to, by simply stating, let's look at the average man or average woman, though endowed with, with incredible gifts, I don't want to just look at Kirk as another person. There are things about Kirk that make him highly unusual and bizarre in many ways. I'll tell you just a few. So some, some are personality quirks. And some are just these incredible gifts that I, I still am kind of mind boggled, boggled in the mind about. Uh, so we think, we don't know, we think that he probably had a photographic memory. And he would often, actually, I should say, not he, but his students who came to Macosta would often challenge him. And they'd pull a book off the shelf, and he had a, a, a library of about 15,000 volumes. In fact, Hillsdale owns all those volumes now. Uh, but he had a, a library of about 15,000 volumes. And his students would, somewhat jokingly and somewhat in awe, pull down a book that he had not looked at for 30 years. And they would read the first line of a page. And Kirk could not only say, oh, that is page 67 of the 1942 edition of Thomas Jefferson's papers, but the rest of the page reads, and he could read it, even if he had not seen the book in 30, 40 years, uh, and he knew it verbatim. And it's one reason that he quotes so often in his books other people, and I have to admit, I've never, I've never caught a mistake um, in those books. He also did something similar with his letters. We know that he was an avid, absolutely avid letter writer. And there were certain days that he could actually, and these could be short, but he could produce close to 300 letters. He corresponded with any, anyone who wrote him. He made sure that he wrote back. And it didn't matter if the person was famous or completely unknown. He always made sure that he wrote back. And he had correspondence all the time because of his writing. He was a, a major, Kirk was a major cultural figure, especially in the 1950s and 60s. And people sought him out all the time. They sought him out for advice. Time Magazine named him one of the 15 most important intellectuals in the world in the late 1950s. So he was recognized uh, almost everywhere during the 50s and the 1960s. But he also had interesting habits. So he rarely went anywhere without his revolver. He rarely went anywhere without wearing his three-piece tweed suit. Uh, we even know that when he crossed the North African desert going from Egypt all the way to Morocco in the summer of 1963, the year before he got married. He and Thomas Molnar, a Hungarian scholar, crossed the desert. In the summer, Kirk wore his three-piece tweed outfit uh, because he thought it was the humane thing to do. He thought it was the civilized thing to do. So, yeah, and he wore that in Hillsdale when he taught at Hillsdale College. He wore that in Macosta. He used to always carry with him a huge sword cane. And what I mean by that is he had a massive cane that when necessary, he could pull a sword out of it. It always had the sole. It was a scabbard. And he had that. And there were times, especially when he was in rough areas, in Scotland that he had to use it. So you guys have to remember, this is pre-TSA. Uh, this is before the, the, the airplanes really checked on these kinds of things. So the other thing Kirk wore, and I guess he loved wearing it in Hillsdale to kind of freak out the townies, but one of the things that Kirk wore is he had, in 1965, he had won the Count Dracula Award for his fiction, and he was given as an award a huge... Uh, Dracula cape, you know, with the high collar and the kind of stereotypical, and he loved that. That that was one of his favorite things to wear. So he would walk around Hillsdale. He would walk, say, from campus downtown, and he would have not only his full Dracula cape, but he would have underneath then his three-piece tweed suit, and he would always have that big sword cane uh, that he walked around with everywhere. And you know, he, he looked like a, a 
a wizard. <laughs> Just, and this, Kirk, thought this was hilarious, uh, but it also became very normal for him as well. He also found it impossible not to tell stories, so uh, he, he refused to drive a car. He had to during World War II, but he refused to afterwards. And Hillsdale students, when he was teaching at the college, would drive up. So they would drive up to Macosta, pick up Dr. Kirk, bring him back. He would teach for a couple of days, and then they'd have to drive him back, and the student would have to come back. And Kirk would hardly talk. He didn't like small talk, but he might pass a house that he found interesting en route between Hillsdale and Macosta. And he would just start telling a story about that house, about a witch who once lived there, who happened to be a Carthaginian queen at one time. You know, suddenly Dido would be uh, revived here in the middle of Michigan, and he would tell these long stories, none of them true, of course, uh, but all these kind of great mythical stories. And he did that all the time. He, As his wife Annette once said to me, everything Russell touched became magical. And I I can't deny that in everything that I've read about Russell Kirk, there is this enchanting element in everything that he does. So here's something that's a lot more practical, and yet there's an artistic sense to it as well. Kirk wrote, as one of my friends who's passed away, Wesley McDonald once said, Kirk actually wrote more in his life than most intelligent women and men read in their lifetimes. Now think about that. Think about how much each of us reads and imagine if Kirk wrote more than the sum of everything we've read. Plus Kirk never stopped reading and with that photographic memory and he was a genius. Right? I'm sure his IQ was somewhere north of 160. Right? This is a this is incredible to think about all these talents coming together. But then you add a practical talent to this as well. He typed almost perfectly about 120 words a minute. And we know that he could do two or three things at the same time he was writing a book. So he would be sitting at his desk in his library in Macosta, and he would just be typing away on a book while at the same time giving advice to a student over here about which book to read, which book not to read, and talking to his wife about what the dinner plans were for that night. He could do all of those things at once, and it didn't bother Kirk. Kirk would just keep typing. And for those of you who've ever had a chance to read Kirk's writings, whether his fiction or his, his nonfiction, his articles or his books, there are never errors in his books. Uh, Bill Buckley used to be amazed that Kirk, whenever he would turn his columns into National Review, all they would have to do is immediately type them up and post them in the magazine. They never had to be edited. There was nothing to be edited. They were perfect grammatically as well as stylistically. There were never typos or errors. And I have had the privilege, thanks to Annette Kirk, his widow, I have had the privilege of reading thousands of Kirk's letters. And at most, I found a typo every thousand to five thousand letters. That was it. I mean, even in his letters, he could just whip these things off. Uh, just really stunning. And you can imagine what you could get done if you could type consistently for hours on end, 120 words a minute. So what did Kirk write? Well, I've tried to divide up his writing between the late 1940s and 1964, and then 1965 to 1994, when he died. And there's a reason I do that. 1964 changed a lot for Kirk. It was a critical, absolutely critical year for him. And it changed the way that he viewed himself and changed the way that he viewed his own writing, that is, his own authorship. So in 1964, three things happened to Kirk. Number one, he gets married. And he it's a late marriage for him. He's 45. He will turn 46 almost immediately after he's married. And he'll have four daughters pretty quickly after that. So he becomes a family man. That means that until he's 45, he's a bachelor. He can write 
all the time. He can travel all the time. There are no restrictions on his life. That will change when he gets married because now he's a family man. He is a husband. He is a father. He can't travel quite as much. It also means that when he writes, he's going to need to write for money as opposed to just writing on kind of a whim. And that's going to matter as well. The second thing that happens to Russell Kirk in 1964 is he gets for a year extremely political and he becomes deeply involved in Barry Goldwater's campaign for the presidency that year and Goldwater loses at, at at an astounding rate. I think he only gets something like 38% of the American vote and it's a devastating blow. Now it, overall that loss is extremely good for conservative conservatism because it rallies conservatives and though they're not ready as an electoral body in 1964 they will be in 1980 and it's going to take those 16 years and it's going to take Reagan but Goldwater is for all intents and purposes and, and forgive the the kind of analogy here but Goldwater is the John the Baptist for Reagan being you know, that. Obviously, I can't even say that, but you know where I'm going with it. Uh, but yeah, I don't want to say that sounds blasphemous, but it, it really is. Uh, Goldwater does serve as a kind of John the Baptist figure for the conservative movement. And Kirk is a vital role, plays a vital role in that, as does Harry Jaffa. They're the kind of two great advisors for Barry Goldwater in 1964. But the result of this for Kirk is that whereas in 1960, Everybody read Kirk because he was not political, even though he was conservative, but he was not politically partisan. After 1964, Kirk's reputation declined so drastically that he really only fully recovers it right about his death. So it's going to take him 30 years to recover his reputation. He had been everything in 1960. By 1965, he's really almost nothing uh, because of how drastically his reputation falls. And he will spend the last 60 years climbing out of that hole and trying to uh, reclaim, which was not difficult for him because it was honest, but he was trying to reclaim his non-political self during that time period. The final thing that happened to Russell Kirk, and we'll talk more about this, Later, the final thing that happened to him was he converted to Roman Catholicism in 1964. In August, in fact, uh, on the Feast of St. Augustine, he became Russell Amos, which was his given name. His middle name was Amos. He became Russell Amos Augustine Kirk. He took Augustine as his patron saint. Now, this is also a big deal, and you can feel it in his writing. Kirk would have been, prior to 1964, a very serious Stoic pagan. It was not a, a half-hearted paganism. He truly believed in the Stoics, and in fact, he never really got rid of his Stoicism. Even on his deathbed, he had Marcus Aurelius's Meditations, along with Chesterton's Ballad of the White Horse and Holy Scripture, right next to his bed, and they were probably three of the most important books. Scripture meant more to him, but Marcus Aurelius still meant a lot as well, as did all the great Stoics. So there was an element there where Kirk never really got beyond that Stoicism. But here's what matters. When he converts to Catholicism in 1964, and it honestly wouldn't matter if he became Eastern Orthodox or if he became some form of Protestant, he stops searching for the, the deepest things in life. He becomes very satisfied with Catholicism and with Christianity. And in 1957, you can feel this deep existential search and crisis on the part of Kirk that makes him an extremely interesting writer. But once he's accepted Christianity, his fiction gets a lot better, but his nonfiction really kind of takes almost all of Christianity for granted, and therefore he's not asking in the same way the deepest questions. I, it sounds, and I feel like as I'm saying this right now, it sounds like I'm criticizing him or kind of knocking him. I'm not. Uh, I think any of us would crave that kind of surety. I'm merely saying that his writing style is not as effective after 1964 
as it was prior to 1964. So for those three reasons, again, because of his marriage and his family, because of his politics and what happens with the Goldwater campaign, and then because of his own changes in religious attitude. But Kirk's scholarly output, his academic output, his writing output is nothing short of astounding. Before 64, and after 64. I mean, just, just think about this. Prior to 1964, so he starts in 1949 uh, and up to 1964, so in those 15 years, he publishes nine books of history and cultural criticism. He published his first novel, which was a New York Times bestseller. He made more on that novel, Old House of Fear, than he made on all of his other books combined during his career. He published more than 400 articles in those 15 years. He wrote 26 reference articles for major encyclopedias, and these weren't little short things. These were massive articles that he wrote for Collier's and for other, other uh, encyclopedias. He wrote 60 book reviews in those 15 years, and he wrote 17 book introductions, and he wrote 10 short stories. So let me quickly repeat that. In the 15 years leading up to 1964, he published nine books of history and cultural criticism, his first novel, 400 articles, 26 reference articles, 60 book reviews, 17 book introductions, and 10 short stories. In addition to that, he founded two scholarly journals, Modern Age in 1957, 57, and the University Bookman in 1960. And on top of that, he wrote a number of personal travel logs, many of which he only gave to his friends and didn't, didn't publish for, well, public consumption. And that, that's incredible. Now, what about afterwards? Between 1965 and 1994, he published 14 books of cultural criticism, 408 articles, 32 original chapters in edited books, 182 book reviews, two novels, and eight short stories. And he continued to edit the University Bookman. And he served as the series editor for Transaction Publications Library of Conservative Thought, over which he saw the editing and publication of 25 volumes, right? That's that's stunning. So that's all just from 1965 until his death in 1994. Let me, let me repeat those. 14 books of cultural criticism and history, 408 scholarly articles, 32 original chapters and edited books, 182 book reviews, two novels, and eight short stories. So combine all of that from 1949 up until his death in 1994, the man was somewhat of a machine. And in addition to that, I'm not done, in addition to that, between 1962 and 1975, Kirk was the editor of an extremely popular newspaper series called To The Point. And during that time period, from 1962 until 1975, Kirk published over 3,000 newspaper columns, and he was known for so many people. He was known as the columnist for To The Point. That was his great column, 3,000 newspaper articles, in addition to everything else that he was publishing in terms of actual articles, books, short stories, and novels. Yeah, this, is, this is truly incredible to think about what he was doing. He once was asked, well, what is it that allows you to write so many newspaper columns in addition? And he said he had six rules for himself when writing newspaper articles. Number one, write about topics for which he had a good understanding and never step on the toes of those who knew better than himself. Number two, never write anything to a reader and assuming that they are ignorant. Always write at your best level, most intelligent level for your reader. Number three, never simply pontificate, but always tell the best stories that you can, stories that people can relate to. Number three, always cherish differences of opinion. 
especially when someone takes your ideas seriously but disagrees with you. You should cherish that they took your ideas seriously. You should cherish those differences of opinion as respect and as respect not just for you as the writer, but to them as taking the time to respond to you, which is why Kirk always responded to every letter he ever received. Number five, always attack fads as merely conformist propaganda of the moment. And number six, never forget that you, the author, are as fallible as every other person. Those are six pretty great guidelines when we think about Kirk and what he's trying to do here. But here's what one person wrote about him, trying to describe, and this is actually a pretty famous historical and political philosopher, a man by the name of Paul Gottfried, what he said, trying to understand what Kirk was like as a writer, as a typist. Russell was a solitary aesthetic character. He was a marvel who in all likelihood never agonized over his compositions. He would draw a single wreath of smoke out of his cigar each time he paused in his typing, and then he would bring forth what inevitably followed. Imagine. Right? <laughs> so, watching him type reminded me of an arresting statement that I once heard Leonard Bernstein make about Beethoven. It was Bernstein's contention that even if Beethoven was not the equal of Mozart as a melodist, nobody in the history of music had constructed compositions like his, in which every passage came forth with ineluctability from whatever preceded it. No matter how often Beethoven was interrupted in his work, each time he went back to it, he devised the only possible combination of notes that could have continued what he had already begun before. Russell wrote in the same way. Right? What, what a great way to think about this. This idea that Russell was like Beethoven. Not Mozart. Not quite that great. But like Beethoven. Right? Basically second best. But still amazing in what he did. But that's what it was like watching Dr. Kirk at the typewriter. Another person said when coming to interview him for the Detroit Free Press that sometimes when Kirk talks it's like listening to a book itself talking. And that I think tells us a lot about who Kirk was and what it was that he really really could do in terms of his great talents. Okay, so I want to give you I'm going to switch gears here just a little bit and talk about what is it that makes Dr. Kirk such a great writer? That is, why is he so compelling to us? And I want to give a little bit of background to who and what he was. So as I've mentioned a couple of times, Dr. Kirk was born in 1918, and he was born in Plymouth, Michigan, which is now a really, really nice suburb of Detroit. But in 1918, Plymouth was a has-been town, a railroad town that was already in a bad area with really very little industry to speak of. It was an area of deep, deep poverty. It was a very troubled area in 1918. And it's really, it's not going to recover for decades. It's really not as far as I know until the 1970s when it's seen as a bedroom community for Detroit that it starts doing well again. Now, Plymouth is super nice, but it was really bad when Kirk was born. And he was born into extreme poverty. And that poverty remained with him throughout his life. Now, not in terms of him making money. We know that during his life, he was making millions of dollars, not just on his published writings, but on his speeches. When you add all that together, he was making so much money. But that poverty always went with him in terms of attitude, because for Kirk, money was never, ever, ever more than a means to an end. It was always meant, like any talent, if God gave you the ability to run, to glorify God, you run like the wind. If God gives you money to glorify God, you give it away. That was Kirk. And partly, I don't want to say that was just because he'd grown up in poverty. But in fact, not at all. I think this has to do a lot with Kirk's own, a lot. 90% of that is Kirk's Christian charity, 
to be certain. But there was that element of understanding what it was like to be poor in which he helped anybody and everybody in need. In fact, uh, I, I will say this, no matter how much I talk about Kirk's ideas or his writings, if you take away nothing else, and I hope you do take away more, but if 50 years from now you remember this class, I would more than anything else like you to know that when Russell Kirk died in 1994, he was broke. Why was he broke? Not because he was a poor money manager, but because he gave everything he earned away. He gave it to anybody who needed it. And I'll talk more about that later. But that to me is the astounding thing about Russell Kirk. I have never in my own life studied someone who comes closer to sainthood than Russell Kirk in his lifetime, especially when it comes to his charity. J.R.R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis come very close. Uh, and I would not, I mean, if, if there was ever a formal move by the Anglican or the Roman Catholic or Orthodox Church to make any one of those three officially a saint, I would in no way be shocked. Uh, they, to me, should be sanctified and should be beatified as saints, but that's that's another topic. But I do want you to remember that for Russell Kirk, it was his immense charity. So he grows up in poverty. He has kind of a ne'er-do-well dad. In fact, we hardly ever find him appealing to his father. He doesn't have good conversations with his father. There's no resentment. There's no disliking there between Kirk and his father. There's just not a deep respect that he has for his father. But for his mother, all the respect in the world. His mother is deeply deeply intellectual and deeply saint-like in the way that she raises Russell and his sister in her motherhood, in the way that she sacrifices herself for them. There is a deep love in all of that. And Kirk will always admire his mother. Uh, to the end of his days, his mother will mean everything to him. His father, not so much, but his mom's dad, everything. Kirk never stopped talking or writing about his father's dad, about his mother's dad. Did I say father's dad? His mother's dad, his maternal grandfather, Frank Pierce, right? Now, that was a real man. And he was a real man, not only because of the way he handled himself in day-to-day -day situations, but to Kirk's mind, he was a real man because he never stopped reading either. He was not just a man of action, he was a man of words, and he was a man who understood the gift of the intellect and how much the intellect meant. And so Kirk will always draw upon his grandfather as his great moral exemplar, his great moral male exemplar. His mother is his great moral female exemplar, but they each will serve them in a variety of different ways as Kirk's role models. So Kirk is not really the son of his father. He's the son of his mother's father. He is the son of his grandfather. That would be the best way to think about who and what he was. And that's how he always identified himself. After high school, Kirk was given a full ride to Michigan State, then Michigan State College. He had actually won the great, I don't know if this magazine is still around. There was a magazine, and it was still around when I was a student. It was called Scholastic Magazine. I know Scholastic is still around because they published the Harry Potter books, but there was a Scholastic Magazine, same company. Again, whether they still publish this magazine or not, I don't know. Uh, but there was a magazine when Kirk was in high school that would offer a big scholarship every year for the best essay written by a senior in high school. And at the last minute, literally, this essay had to be postmarked the next morning. Kirk decided to write an essay, and he had no idea what he was going to write his essay about. And it was, like I said, a last minute thing. He had something like six hours. Maybe he started writing it at one in the morning. And he had to have it postmarked by six, seven the next morning at the post office, probably eight, actually. So he had about seven hours. And he opened his desk drawer. And in that desk drawer, he had a number of family heirlooms, little ones, uh, bullets from the Civil War and other things. And so he just pulled them out one by one. And he wrote an essay called Mementos, which is uh, He's a senior in high school, but he's writing at the level of a very, very well 
known, say, 30-year-old, 35-year-old uh, at that point. It's an extremely good essay, even though he writes it very quickly. And it was a, a, an instantaneous topic, but he does beautifully, and he wins the scholarship. He could have gone anywhere in the country. He had never left Michigan, and therefore the idea of going to, say, an Ivy League school or even Notre Dame uh, was just out of the realm of possibility for him. It was Michigan State. And so he went to Michigan State. And when he got there, he found a group of older men, some professors and some men from the community who had a club dedicated to reading the works of Irving Babbitt and Paul Elmer Moore, the, reading the humanists. And they were humanists. And Kirk was by far the youngest men, member but they welcomed Kirk and they loved Kirk and Kirk loved them. And this was a critical thing for him because during his first two years of college, he read all of Irving Babbitt and most of Paul Emmer Moore. And he had never, he had always been extremely intelligent. I hadn't told you this yet, but for example, by the time he was 12, Kirk had read all of the works of Thomas Jefferson, including his letters. And he had read all the works of Karl Marx because Kirk was absolutely certain, even at the age of 11 and 12, that these were the two great figures in the modern world, Jefferson and Marx, and that it was the duty of every good American to decide between them, which was more accurate, Marx or Jefferson. Of course, Kirk chose Jefferson and fell in love with the Declaration and the founding. But he was very young. He had read all of James Fenimore Cooper. He had read Sir Walter Scott uh, before he was even a teenager. So yeah, this is an extremely intelligent, very, very advanced young man. Uh, but he had not really gotten into any kind of cultural or political philosophy. And that's what Babbitt and Moore provided for him, along with that group of men that he met in the early 19, uh, late 1930s. This group was very, very important to him. Kirk graduates with honors, of course, and even is able to publish during, I mean, I could, sorry, I could get into so many stories about Kirk and I've got to be careful that I don't just go off on the, off into the deep here. But uh, even as a young man at college, Kirk was able to publish essays in academic journals, like full essays, full scholarly academic essays being published in peer-reviewed academic journals. Kirk was able to do that during his college career because he was such a great writer. And in fact, one of the journals called College English absolutely refused to believe when Kirk told them he was an undergraduate. They refused to believe it. And they published him as a professor of English at Michigan State University, even though he was only 20 at the time that this... Uh, article came out, and this actually made national news when people realized what had happened. Uh, it was the first time Kirk had made national news because of this. Uh, but, you know, Kirk was honest. He told them, I'm an undergraduate, and they would not believe it. They thought it was some kind of prank. And so they they published him as a, a, a professor of English. Anyway, I love that story, but uh, it's not what I wanted to talk about. So, when Kirk graduated from college, he decided that he wanted to go on to graduate school, and he ended up choosing Duke University, and he had gotten into a lot of graduate programs, but he had never been out of Michigan. This is the first time he'd been out of Michigan, and he goes down to North Carolina. He absolutely loved the train ride, and it became one of his passions to ride trains. He loved the train ride between Michigan and North Carolina. He loved the train stops. He loved the passengers on the train. He loved the whole idea of train travel. And this is the first time he discovers how much he loves to explore old things, old towns. He loves to go hiking. He loves to meet people, especially it seems like everywhere Kirk went, he would meet what he said was a pretty girl, uh, always someone his age that, or a college student when he was a grad student, right? So he's 21 and they're 20. Uh, but everywhere he goes, he's got these girlfriends. And I put girlfriends in scare quotes because really they were just friends who happened to be young women. But he loved that. Uh, he loved 
being in the company of pretty young girls, as he would say. Uh, and he was all the time. So he would have these people that he knew in the various stops. He made friends along the way. He would be invited to stay at people's houses, which is interesting because he was not gregarious. But there was something about this train travel that just brought all of this out. And yet when he got to Duke, he hated it. He hated every minute of grad school. He thought his classes were ridiculous. The only thing he liked about grad school, and he almost certainly was probably better read and smarter than his professors there, but the only thing that he really liked about grad school was the ability to read as much as possible. But he knew, I mean, he absolutely knew that it would be just as possible for him to read if he were, say, working for a bookstore back in Michigan, which would have been you know, totally, totally fine with him as well to do something like that. So he really disliked grad school. And we see this in the fact that Duke wanted him to stay not only for a second year to get a master's degree, but they wanted him to stay and get his PhD at Duke. And Duke was a major, it was a major grad school at this point. And Kirk not only refused to take the PhD there, but he adamantly refused to stay for a second year for his master's. And so he ended up writing his dissertation, his master's thesis in three weeks. He wrote a master's thesis on John Randolph of Roanoke, who was the first Speaker of the House under Thomas Jefferson and later broke with Jefferson. And there's a great history to Randolph in and of himself. But Kirk wrote that in three weeks. And that later became his first book published in 1951 with hardly any changes at all. It's basically just that master's thesis that he wrote in three weeks. But I want to read to you, this is what his defense was like. And he recorded this in his diary afterwards, what his thesis defense was like at Duke, and you'll get a real sense here of why this didn't matter that much. The chief battle was with a political science man whom the dean's office had put on my committee by mistake instead of an English professor, and I am, after all, minoring in English. He was a scowling, burly, heavily mustached creature who objected to everything from the title onward most sincerely. He was a great nationalist and hardly agreed with Randolph or me. I should have written in jargon, he said, your title is deceptive and false. Political thought has a special technical meaning. To be political thought, it has to be unique. What contribution did Randolph make that was unique? None, I said. This is Kirk and committee. None, I said. Nothing has been unique since Aristotle. Well, in American political philosophy, I mean, he said. None, I said. Thought doesn't have to be unique. It does, said he. It's a special technical term. Well, Kirk responded, I'm not in favor of special technical terms. We're speaking a different language. The, the political science man. Your thesis has nothing to do with political thought, he said. Well, what else would I call a thesis? He ignored that. It's a special technical term, he said yet again. Well, Kirk responded, I'm no great philologist, but I think it's not a matter of philology the political science man said. It's a matter of definition and history and meaning. Kirk responded finally, well, what is your special technical meaning of philology? I inquired, and then I inquired again and again and again. He was no gentleman, but I had the history man, particularly Snyder, on my side, since they hate all political science men who reject almost every history man's thesis they examine. Is there any excuse for it? They're said to resent the fact that history men usually teach political science on the side. <laughs> so here's a 21-year-old Kirk, kind of obnoxious, <laughs> maybe more than a little bit obnoxious. Actually, he would have been 23 at this point. Uh, but here he is, and he just he won't have it. And he gets a pass, and in fact, he gets an A, but uh, he, he will not let people get away with things, and he leaves the moment. He gets this thesis passed. He's out of Duke, never to return. He does not like Duke. So th this was the end of it. When he gets back, though, to Michigan, he's not quite sure what he's going to do because here it was going to be, he was going to have an academic career, or at least it seemed like he was, and uh, he didn't. So he ended up working for Henry Ford. And then the war starts. And Ford starts changing towards wartime production. <laughs> 
Kirk is not a huge fan of this, but he becomes, interestingly enough, the negotiator between the Ford Company and the U.S. bureaucracy, who come and they try and say Ford should make this many tanks and so forth. Kirk becomes that in-between man. He is called up for the draft in the summer of 1942. He had not been drafted before that every time he had gone for his draft hearings because of his eyesight and other problems that he had physically, the draft board had rejected him. But now in 1942, they called him up and they gave him an actual place within the military drafting him. And so he was sent up to Camp Custer in the summer of 1942, that's in Michigan. And from Camp Custer, from Camp Custer, he was sent to the Great Salt Lake facility, the Great Chemical Testing Facility, at Dugway Proving Ground in Tule, in Utah. And again, Kirk has never seen the West. He has never been anywhere beyond the Eastern United States. This is all new to him and it's overwhelming. And it's fascinating what Kirk decides to do in the summer of 1942, as he realizes he's going to be drafted, he, got, he gets with the money that he has from the Ford company that he's earned, he buys a complete set of all of Plato's works, everything on Socrates, and he buys a complete set of all the Stoics. And he decides that if he's going to have to spend time in the military, he is going to learn philosophy, in particular, Platonic and Stoic philosophy. And he does. And this is where Kirk's real Stoicism comes from. It comes from his reading of these works throughout World War II. Throughout World War II, he serves as a company clerk at the Great Sand Dunes in Utah. There is a brief time that he's sent to a chemical, a chemical weapons testing facility in Florida, but he never sees combat through the whole war. He is a company clerk, always domestic, always at a U.S. fort, and mainly near Salt Lake City, out in the Great Salt Lake Desert. It's actually about 90 miles to the south and west of Salt Lake City, but he is in the Great Salt Lake Desert during all of this. It is a huge formative time on him. And there are a couple of things we can say about Russell Kirk as a young man. So he uses his time to read as much as possible. He hikes whenever possible. And one of his favorite things to do is to get his backpack, backpack on and hike alone up into the Great Salt Lake Desert Mountains. There are a number of places like the Camelback and other relatively now famous places in the Great Salt Lake Desert that Kirk would try and conquer alone. And he was usually pretty successful at it. He was an avid hiker and learned the desert environment pretty quickly, which you would have to. Hey, hiking in the desert is something quite different from hiking in the Rockies or hiking in Michigan. Uh, really quite different. And he had to figure all that out. He was good at it. He starts to discover God, probably in the fall of 1942. There's a moment where he's walking near the Camelback, and he's in the shadow of the Camelback, one of the great mountains in the Great Salt Lake Desert, and he's overwhelmed. And in that moment of being overwhelmed by the majesty of the desert and the majesty of the mountains, he decides that there really has to be a greater power. But he adopts the Stoic Logos, this kind of pagan god. He adopts the Stoic, the Stoic Logos as his god, but he's serious about it. He doesn't light incense or pray to it, but it's always in his mind that there is this Logos, this great eternal mind or eternal reason that really does guide us if we allow it in the things that we do and is certainly the author of natural law. So he's an avid hiker. He's an avid reader. He starts writing experimentally for the most part. He creates the company newsletter, which is very funny, called the Sandblast. Uh, I have copies of all of those, or at least all the ones that exist. He has a profound diary that he keeps during this time. He makes all kinds of observations, not only on the officers, but on his fellow enlisted men uh, or draftees during the war. He makes all kinds of comments on the military. He despises Franklin Roosevelt. He thinks of Roosevelt basically at the same level that he thinks of Hitler. One is a domestic enemy. The other is a foreign enemy. I'll explain why here in just a moment. He felt that strongly. He despises the military, and he thinks, and he will think this until the day he dies, that once a republic begins to draft its men, it is no longer a republic. 
A republic for it to exist demands that its men would volunteer to serve to fight in a war, just like they did during the American Civil War, where 94% of Union soldiers were volunteers. For Kirk, that is the model. And the very fact that Franklin Roosevelt in the U.S. government under the New Deal has to draft men to fight is an indication that we've already lost the republic. Because if you have to coerce someone to do the right thing, it is not truly the right thing. It may be the expedient thing. It is not the right thing, and it is not filled with moral goodness by any means. So Kirk becomes convinced of this, and he will never, this will never leave him. Uh, I would go so far as to say the young Kirk in the 1940s is an anarchist. That is not a label he would have given to himself. It's not necessarily a pleasant label. I realize it conjures up kind of whiskered men throwing bombs, but uh, there's almost no way around it that Kirk was so adamantly opposed as a young man to any form of government that he was an anti-statist to the extreme. He even starts corresponding, and he has a long correspondence, with the great anarchist Albert J. Nock during World War II. They befriend one another, and he also corresponds with a libertarian, she's not an anarchist, but a woman named Isabel Patterson, and Kirk corresponds with both of them, and they have a huge influence on his life. But there are two things that happen to Kirk that, or happen around Kirk, that dramatically shape his own views on government and on American society. The first thing that he sees and that disturbs him deeply is, yeah, even hard to talk about, even in 2020, one of the, the worst crimes we've ever, ever committed as Americans, it is the internment of Japanese Americans. Now, there needs to be a little bit of background here. This was Order 9066, right, 9066, under Franklin Roosevelt, his executive order to detain all persons of Japanese ancestry. And I hope you know, right, he didn't just detain them. All of their property was auctioned off. And all of those of Japanese ancestry in America were sent to six different concentration camps. I personally have been to one. I've been to the concentration camp up in Minidoka, Idaho, and I've driven by one in extreme southeastern Colorado, but I did not stop there. But I've explored the one at Minidoka now. It's just a kind of a state park and a monument up in that area of Idaho, but really stunning horrible moments in American history. The rule was that anyone with any Japanese blood quantum was to have their property taken from them and then from them to be taken away. Now, here's the craziness of all of this. Japanese immigration to America had ended by a gentleman's agreement in 1905. This is now 1942. That means that every person of Japanese ancestry in America was or had been in the United States for at least 46, uh, 36 years at this point. Right? That, that means that we're talking about now almost two full generations. It's not as though Japanese nationals started flooding into America right after Pearl Harbor. We had far more people, far more recently from Italy and Germany arriving in America, but they were never imprisoned at the same level that the Japanese were. This was complete and utter racism in every way, and Kirk was horrified by this. So during his first furlough, Kirk hitchhiked. So in addition to actual backpacking and hiking, he also loved hitchhiking, but he hitchhiked up to from the Great Salt Lake, he hitchhiked up to Pocatello, Idaho, and from there to Minidoka, and he checked out the Japanese internment camp. It was the first thing he did on his first furlough that he had received, and he was horrified. And amazingly enough, he saw something, and I'll read from his diary. It says, Pocatello has become a Japanese colony of thousands. I saw many Japanese boys and girls there. They're now persecuted in earnest. A butcher refused to buy vegetables from his usual Japanese truck gardener, cursing him as yellow scum. The Japanese asserted resentfully that the day would come when he would own that butcher shop. The butcher then took the Japanese man, put him up against the wall, and pinned it to him, pinned the Japanese man to the wall, which is butcher knife. Now, Kirk saw this. 
right? He saw this Japanese man being pinned to a wall with a knife. That's stunning. And talk about the brutality and the racism. Kirk would never, ever get over this. He would always write later on, even into the 1970s, I hear the liberals are once again proclaiming for the rights of minorities. It's funny how silent they were in 1942 when their president was throwing all of the Japanese for no other crime than their race, throwing them into prison. Kirk never forgave the liberals for that. To him, that was always the second worst thing that the progressives did right? by throwing these Japanese and always having to have an enemy. Right? They threw Japanese Americans, quite truly patriotic Americans, into prison. But the second thing that really bothered Kirk to the point that Kirk actually contemplated committing suicide in terms of a stoic understanding of that idea and that concept. I'm not justifying it. I'm just telling you and explaining why he thought about it. The worst thing that ever happened to Kirk's mind was the dropping of the two bombs on Japan, the two atomic bombs, but especially the bomb on Nagasaki. Hiroshima, he thought, made a little bit more sense because of some of the military that was there, but Nagasaki was the one Christian city in all of Asia. It was the capital of Christianity in Asia and had been the capital of Christians in Asia since the 1600s. And Kirk could not in any way, shape or form understand why the Americans would ever choose Nagasaki as a target. And he thought not only was it criminal to develop the atomic bomb, but it was equally criminal to drop it on a group of civilians. He wrote in his diary immediately after the dropping of the bomb, he said, we crush an insect with the club of Hercules. This is the doctrine of progress. It is the most interesting instance of the blind and foolish confidence of Americans in their own God that they have ever expressed. None of the progressives, not Joseph Smith, not William James, not John Dewey, ever knew what shape this progress would take, where it, what, what it went toward. They would never even know its direction. Thus far, apparently, it has been progress only towards annihilation, an end to be accomplished perhaps only with a new and improved atomic bomb. We have dealt more death and destruction in the space of 10 years than all of the men of the Middle Ages with their devil were, supposed, were able to accomplish in over a thousand. Five months later, he wrote again in his diary, five months have elapsed since Hiroshima and Nagasaki were destroyed. In that time, what happened? Have Americans reflected on their sins? Have they considered alternatives to such mechanized destruction of innocence? No. If anything, Americans have become even more conformist, more docile, and they have proven themselves to be nothing more than little puppets to whatever propaganda the government is creating. The dropping of the atomic bomb was simply the trump of doom. It was sounded and the gulf was yawning, and we have to go on listening to the hit parade, striking, drinking, fornicating, cheating, hating. We Americans are miserable little animals in our shambles. I have no hope for us. We cannot expect to rid ourselves in 10 years of all the follies and vices that have been ours for 20,000 years, and probably we have not even 10 years into make our, in which to make our wills and say our prayers. The end is coming. The most human passions and longings as we know them are done for. Refined, aff affections, refined affections and desires cannot exist in this abyss of violence and poverty. Science and popular judgment have brought to us nihilism in thought and fusion in substance. I, and Kirk says, and who am I? I am the worst of all of these. For I, too, go on simply living my life. And therefore, he says, five months after the dropping of the atomic bombs, he tries to make, and it's a very difficult decision for him, he tries to decide in stoic fashion if he has a duty to commit suicide, that is, to bring about his own death, to make amends for what the United States did against civilians in Nagasaki. And obviously, he chooses against that. But it's close. 
And even years later, in 1989, he writes in one of his books, and I'll end with this today. I'll, I'll end actually on a positive note, but let's get through this. And then I'll give us some closing thoughts. And now a few words concerning power among the nations. It is ours already, and we have done with it what men always have done with pure power. We have employed it abominably. I do not say that the Nazis or the Japanese militarists would have employed it to any better advantage, or that the communists would use it mercifully. On the contrary, I am certain that to the best of their ability, they would have striven to accomplish still greater mischief. But that does not excuse us as Americans. The learning of physical sciences and the perfection of technology, instead of being put to the improvement of reason, has been applied by modern man to achieve mastery over nature and of humanity. We Americans happen to be first in the race for the acquisition of the tools of mass slaughter, and we use those tools as the Roman used his sword and his catapult against the Carthaginians. A handful of individuals, some of them quite unused to moral responsibilities on a large scale, made it their business to extirpate the populations of Nagasaki and Hiroshima. We must make it our business to curtail the possibility of such snap decisions, taking simply on the assumptions of worldly wisdom. The real conservative must always urge upon his nation a policy of patience and prudence. A preventative war, whether or not it might be successful in the field, and that is a question much in doubt, would be morally ruinous to us all. There are circumstances under which it is not only more honorable to lose than to win, but quite truly less harmful in the ultimate providence of God. Right? I, I want us to think about that idea. It is better to lose and save your soul than it is to win and lose that soul. And that, I think, is a huge part of conservatism throughout the 20th century. And it's what makes our conservatism in 2020 so very different from the conservatism of Russell Kirk and the conservatism of 1953. The conservatism of 1953 was just as distrustful of the U.S. military as it was of the U.S. welfare state. The welfare state and the warfare state were seen as intimately connected one with another. This is what C. Wright Mills, Robert Nisbet, and later Dwight D. Eisenhower would refer to as the military-industrial complex. But somewhere between George Bush the first and our time, conservatives became extremely comfortable, comfortable with the idea of a very aggressive foreign policy to the point that if we look at it now, we have troops stationed in 150 countries out of 200 countries in the world. This is a radically different thing than we have ever had before. It's radically different than what was true in the Reagan era. It was radically, radically different from what was true during Kirk's era. And Kirk is very fearful that we Americans, because we have this noble heritage, we believe that we can use this military to the right that is to do good in the world, and Kirk is deeply, deeply skeptical of that. And that goes back to his own experience in World War II. Well, let me end on a bit more pleasant note. And that is, when Kirk is let free from the military, he's not discharged, he's drafted. He must remain in the military until 1946. He's a later release in terms of being drafted. But when he's released, he returns to Michigan State, to his home, and he finds that the Michigan State History Department is more than happy, more than happy, to bring him into the department and to give him a full-time faculty position, even though he only has his master's degree. And so for two years, Kirk teaches in the Department of Western Civilization at Michigan State, teaches in humanities, teaches the great books, teaches the great works. But he decides this is not enough, and he really does want to earn a terminal degree. He really does want to get the highest degree possible within history. And so he starts looking around, and he decides that there's only one place he truly wants to go. 
he wants to go to the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. He decides that it must be as good as Cambridge and Oxford, but unlike Cambridge and Oxford, it has not succumbed to modernization in terms of expanding its roads or allowing traffic within the community. So he applies and he gets into the University of St. Andrews. In the fall of 1948, he takes an ocean liner across the ocean. And during that time, as he is on the ocean, he decides that one thing that absolutely must be studied is Edmund Burke. And not just Edmund Burke, but the influence of Edmund Burke on everyone from John Adams all the way up to T.S. Eliot. He decides this on that boat. And it, there's an interesting way he does this. And I, I don't want, this is going to sound like I'm mocking him. I'm not. But I love this. Kirk was madly, madly in love with a young woman named Rosie, who was his sister's best friend. And Kirk had been madly in love with her for a long time. And in what can only be, regard, be regarded as somewhat scandalous, he and Rosie shared a cabin en route to England, or to Scotland. So they shared that six-week cabin, three-week cabin, whatever it was. They were in a cabin together. And nothing untoward happened between them, but you can imagine what the level of temptation must have been like. But in fact, almost immediately, they resented one another, and the stress between the two was just horrible. And right before they were about to land in Scotland, Rosie said to Dr. Kirk, said, no, he's not a doctor yet, but said to Russell Kirk, Russell, I'm sorry. Uh, I don't love you. I'm never going to love you. This has been a terrible moment in my life. I'm not even going to go with you to St. Andrews. The moment we land, I'm taking off and I'm exploring Europe for a couple of weeks. I'll come back and say goodbye, but then I'm heading back to America. And Russell was absolutely heartbroken. And he writes in his diary that he knows he will never find true love again. And this is in October of 1948. I will never true find true love again. My life as a man is over when it comes to women. I must now dedicate myself completely to some new task. What will I do? I will dedicate myself to the ideas and thoughts of Edmund Burke. And that's how he got out of the depression of the breakup. All right, everybody, God bless. I'll see you in two days. We're going to continue talking about Kirk and specifically we're going to look at Kirk as a humane thinker, as a man of letters, but also as a writer of fiction. So see you soon. God bless everyone.